One of the things in my resume that always catches attention is that I worked for Al Gore back in the late 80s, early 90s, and so I'm usually introduced as the guy who helped Al Gore invent the internet. So I'm, I'm glad Alistair didn't do that. Uh, let me explain the outfit I'm wearing today. I think I'm the only person in the room with a tie on, but that's because in Washington, D.C., that's sort of the uniform. And when I flew up this morning on the Delta shuttle from Washington, if I had not been wearing a tie, I probably would have gotten extra security measures because my name is Mike Nelson which is the second most common alias in this country after John Smith. I'm going to focus today not on technology, I'm going to focus much more on the people piece of the equation. When we talk about open data, transparency, we need to focus a lot on the people part of the equation. And much of the discussion so far has been on the technology and the, the business aspects of this. Uh, as Alistair mentioned, for the last three and a half years, I've been teaching at Georgetown in the Communications Culture and Technology Program. It's a unique, multidisciplinary program. I've been the technologist working with sociologists, political scientists, economists, and communication specialists as we all try to figure out how these technologies are rolling out and how they're going to change our businesses. I've recently joined the Leading Edge Forum. Uh, you heard Simon Wardley this morning, one of my colleagues at the forum. Uh, my first project is on transparency, and so I'm going to share with you some of the highlights of that project uh, as a professor, I'm used to speaking in 55-minute segments. I'm going to try to jam all this into 35 minutes. Uh, I will be around for the rest of the afternoon if anybody wants to delve more deeply into any one of these slides and uh, be happy to discuss further. So the question really is, how do we deal with transparency in this new, new age of information overload? We all have heard this morning about the incredible growth in, in technology and the amount of data that we're all handling in our companies. We know how easy it is to move that data around now, particularly when somebody like Bradley Manning can put a quarter of a million classified emails on a, on a DVD disc. It's not only a matter that it's easier to move the data around, there's a lot more people who want that data, a lot more pressure from our employees, from regulators, from the press to share information. The investment community, our business partners, the companies we outsource to, they're all getting more and more data that used to stay inside the company firewall. So over the last 20 years, we've seen this dramatic increase in the amount of data, a factor of 100 in many companies. At the same time, increasing pressure to share that data as we create these ecosystems of innovation and we lower the barriers between companies. And that leads to this purple arrow, which is about control. The odds that a company can control every bit of information that leaves the premises is going to near zero. Something's going to leak out. And that's what happened with WikiLeaks. That was the, really the case study that triggered this study uh, at the start of the year. WikiLeaks is a great example of what happens when these trends collide. One guy is alleged to have released more than a decade's worth of classified State Department cables, hundreds of thousands of military after-action reports, uh, compromising all sorts of diplomatic relationships around the world. One guy in one office where they didn't happen to apply the right computer security procedures. The first reaction of a lot of companies to that was, oh my god, that could happen to us. And so the first reaction was to lock everything down. Governments and corporations really started reviewing their cybersecurity plans. In many cases, they doubled or tripled the amount of money they were spending on cybersecurity. But at some companies, they had just the opposite reaction. They thought a little bit about this and they realized that the right question wasn't, how do you lock everything down? The right question was, do I need to lock everything down? And in many cases, they started to realize that no. Much of the data that has always been assumed to be confidential and internal was information they could and should be sharing in some way, either with limited communities outside the company or with the entire wide world. One of the most interesting effects of the WikiLeaks scandal is that it's actually informed people all around the world about why the U.S. has been pursuing some of the policies it's been pursuing. In some cases, by sharing these secret cables, we've informed everyone, including world leaders and the press, 
about what it is that the U.S. is worried about and what they're doing to address problems from Iran to the global finance crisis to poverty in Africa. So that's, what's, that, that's an interesting switch. And, and in these companies, they've come to realize what's really going on. If you look at all the information in a company, there's a little bit of good news, there's a little bit of bad news, and there's a lot of routine news. And the typical job in the past of a PR organization was to cover up everything but the good news. And if you had a really good PR firm, you would take some of the ordinary news and turn it into good news. You would spin it. But what happens with the bloggers and with WikiLeaks is that the bad news leaks. Actually, that's the first thing that leaks. So at some point, it becomes imperative that you start sharing more, that you start sharing more of the good news and the mundane news so that the context is there when the bad news leaks out. And that's what's starting to happen. The other thing that's starting to happen is that companies are realizing that if they want more internal transparency, more internal communication, they need to open up externally. And so this is a, a, a diagram showing what happens if you can move from left to right externally. If you can move from secrecy, where everything is carefully constrained and you only share information with careful licensing agreements, you sign NDAs every day, if you can move from that kind of world to one where you're, the default is to share, where you're inviting people to innovate with you, you're sharing data, that, that can actually drive change internally. If you're sharing externally, if everyone understands that much of your formerly confidential information is to be shared, that makes it much easier to move information between divisions and to move from the lockdown culture to a learning culture where people are sharing online, using social media inside the firewall, and where it's not so hard to drag information out of one division or one office. The other thing that happens when you move to a more open, transparent corporation is that you get two things. You get new, high-value services, new opportunities, so you can move up on the vertical axis, creating new value, and you get more accountability moving from right to left. The goal, in some cases, is to be wide open, to really share a lot more information and to not only create new services, create new information sources that your customers can use to buy your, to be, get excited about your products, but also to make your employees more accountable, to trace back when something happens inside, to know what's really going on. So that's kind of the way we're looking at this. Again, this is a 20-minute a, a slide to go into great detail. But you can see in this chart that we, we have two goals, accountability and, and, and value creation. So how do you va create value? Well, we're looking at nine different areas of transparency. And I'm going to run through these with about a minute and a half per area. Some of them are well known. We've already discussed several of these. Other ones are more interesting because they're sort of new on the scene. They're things that haven't been developed that much. The first item is transparency at the C-suite. And this is what most people have been talking about for the last 10 years when they've talked about transparency. Wired Magazine did a very uh, controversial cover story about five years ago called Get Naked and Rule the World, all about what happens when the CEO opens up and gets more uh, transparent about what he or she is thinking. Lots of good reasons to do this. It creates buzz, it inspires your team, it drives the management harder when they know that the boss is out there on the line talking about their goals. And it obviously creates, creates a higher profile for the, for the company. On the other hand, sometimes CEOs say the wrong things, results in lawsuits, you get half-baked ideas out there, and because of LexisNexis, they never go away. So that's pretty traditional. But there's, of course, other opportunities here. One is innovation in the open. We're hearing a little bit about this. Two examples that uh, we point to are uh, Linux, which is sort of the prototype of open innovation. And then Eli Lilly and GlaxoKleinBeacham, the uh, drug companies. They've made all their drug trial data available after the trials are done. So people can go in and see how the tests were done. And this increases trust in the results of those studies. Again, lots of reasons to do it. Show your leadership, excite people about what you're doing, drive standards in your direction. The downside is people can take your ideas and steal them if you don't move fast enough to implement them. 
Another example is personnel data. Uh, I worked in the US Congress with Senator Gore for five years. All my personnel, all my uh, salary data was available online. Every congressional employee had their salary printed. Um, I don't think people could believe we got paid so little, but it was right there. They're starting to do this in California and other places. And a great example, if you want to explore what can happen by making personnel data available, is a book called The Seven Day Weekend by an executive in Brazil who completely transformed his company by just opening up the floodgates, by just making everything that happened in his company open to the public. Again, lots of reasons to do this. Higher trust level, fairer salary structure. And of course, some problems is if everyone knows who's working for you, if everyone knows how great your employees are, they might be poached away by someone else. Sales figures, another place that we've already talked about. Um, case study here, of course, is Amazon book ratings and um, what the movies do. Uh, again, uh, lots of reasons to do it. Show that you, what your great new products are. The problems, of course, is that when things aren't going so well, everyone knows. Fifth point is um, sharing customer data. And we had to just talk about this at the very start of the day. Um, this is, I think, one of the most exciting areas where big data is going to play a difference. Uh, I just learned last week about an amazing study called the, the 2010 Real Rate Report. And this comes from CT Time Matrix, which is a part of Walters Kluwer. They do billing for law firms and for corporate uh, councils. So over the course of a year, they collect millions of items in legal bills that they are now using to determine what the fair price is for legal services. So they have a best-selling report here that is probably going to change the way legal services are purchased by corporations all around the world. And as they dig more deeply into this data, I think it's going to cause a real transformation in the way legal services are priced. Another example many of you have probably heard of is data.mint.com at Intuit. Um, Mint.com will keep track of all your credit card receipts, which enables Intuit to make very detailed profiles of which companies are charging what in your hometown. So you can see which are the most popular restaurants among people who use the Intuit service. And we all know about the Netflix prize, which for about a million dollars investment has generated tens of millions of dollars in increased sales for Netflix. It's one of the few examples where we actually can put a number on the financial benefits that come from these kind of projects. One of my challenges in this initiative in this report was to actually quantify the benefits of transparency, and it's not always easy to do. But here we have a clear, clear, huge return on investment. Um, again, lots of reasons to do this. You build an ecosystem around you, you get a lot of people partnering with you. Uh, on the other hand, it can lead to fears of privacy violations, and in some cases we've seen companies attempt to do this kind of thing and not properly anonymize the data, leading to individual customers and their preferences being identified and even printed in the paper. Another uh, area of transparency is customer complaints. Uh, this is an area where most companies who work with individuals have really have no choice. They're, they're, the complaints are going to be out there, either on Yelp or TripAdvisor or Amy's List or some of the, uh, Angie's List or some of the other re re review sites. If you do it right, you get a clear example of how your company is responding to customers. And as we, uh, show, as we saw earlier uh, in the, the, the talk this morning about customer complaints, you can actually generate uh, a, a pricing advantage if you're shown to be responding to those complaints in an effective way. Another really interesting and controversial area of transparency is pricing and purchasing data. In some industries, this isn't even allowed. It's not legal. In certain countries, it's not legal. But in other places, being more upfront about what you charge for your services can generate customer loyalty, can um, simplify negotiations, and a number of companies, particularly in the airlines, have tried this kind of uh, approach. And then probably the most interesting and diverse area of transparency is day-to-day -day operations. And these range all over the place. Uh, webcams at uh, ski resorts can tell potential skiers whether it's a good day to go to the slopes or not, whether it's fogged in or overcrowded. Um, cruise ships have these, have these uh, cameras as well, but it's a lot more than that. 
Uh, in government, we're seeing a lot of exciting applications. The Sunlight Foundation has convinced several members of Congress to publish their entire daily schedule, listing everyone they meet with. The White House does that as a matter of course. And then there are lots of initiatives, both at the local level in the U.S. and at the U.K., to reveal crime statistics and to put them out in very interesting visualizations. Another example of where this is happening, whether governments want it or not, is uh, this report on global mapping of technology for transparency and accountability. If you're really interested in what's going on uh, among government watchdogs, this is a great text. And if you haven't gotten a copy of this, it's available online for free. And it goes around the world looking at examples where people are using technology and big data to track what government is really doing and how elections are being run, how laws are being implemented, in many cases rooting out corruption. Very exciting applications of big data. And uh, it just came out about three months ago. Well worth reading. And then the last example, okay, just, uh, just to um, comment here. Of course, there's lots of reasons to be more open, to generate publicity through webcams and the like. It shows what you're up to, it makes your customer feel they're really part of the operation. Uh, and it, um, it fosters an ecosystem. It allows your partners to better understand what you're doing. Um, some concerns about privacy, about your clientele walking in front of the cameras. Uh, some concerns about uh, di disclosing information that moves markets. That's actually a very serious concern if you're publishing some of the day-to-day -day operational uh, figures about sales and the like. But, uh, and then there's also the problem of accuracy of your data. If you're publishing information and then it turns out it's not correct, that's pretty embarrassing. On the other hand, if you're publishing the data, that will be a, a push to get your employees to make sure the data is correct. And then the last area is uh, crisis management. Uh, and being more transparent is an incredible boon when something bad happens. Whether you're British Petroleum or uh, a drug company that has to have a product recall, being out there day to day, having a reputation for being transparent is incredibly helpful when the bad news hits and there needs to, you need to go out to the public and explain why there was a mishap, what you're doing about it, if you start from a high level of trust, because of transparency, you're in a much better position when the crisis hits. But you don't have time to, to you have to have the mechanisms in place to, to do it right, to make sure the information you're divulging is correct. So, what are the benefits? Well, one of the biggest benefits of being more transparent is that you can help resolve what I call the trust tension. For more than 20 years, we've had this fight between individuals who want to go online to buy something and vendors who want to sell something to them. The individuals would prefer not to share any personal information. They don't want to put in their credit card number and phone number or anything more than they need to. They don't want all that information being stored and collected about them. The less personal identifiable in information that they share, the better. At the same time, the vendor wants it all. They want to know enough information to establish your identity. They want to know enough information to personalize the service they're giving you. They want to decrease fraud. They want to maximize profit. In some cases, they want to do dynamic pricing so they can set the price according to how much they think you're going to pay. And there's been this fight. And, and so far, we haven't resolved it. In some cases, countries have stepped in and tried to draw, they've tried to draw a line, tried to specify that Vendors can't collect more than a certain amount of data or that they have to erase it after a certain number of months. I think the only answer here is transparency. We have to get off of this one-dimensional fight and add a second variable to the equation. We have to start thinking about how companies can be more transparent about what they're doing with the data. So if we go up this graph, we get to a world where the company is sharing much more about what data they have about you, how it's protected, how it's being used, who they're sharing it with, why they're collecting it, and how it benefits you. I call this mutually assured disclosure. I give you more information, but you have to give me more information. And the result is we can get to a place where both sides have more information, both sides are more willing to share information, and as a result, we have more efficiency, better services, and happier customers. So what do you do? At our group, at the Leading Edge Forum, we don't focus on best practices. We don't focus on what people are doing today. 
we tend to look at next practices. What are the most innovative companies doing in this area? And there are a number of things. We've done interviews with a number of companies around the world. Uh, the first thing is, of course, get a discussion going. This isn't something that just happens in the IT department or in the corporate communications department. This is actually an issue that cuts across the marketing department, the human resources department, the lawyers are going to be there. It really does take a pretty broad discussion. You have to have clear policies. Start letting people understand that there's a benefit to sharing. In most companies, we've had so much focus on cybersecurity and privacy that the default is hold it tight, don't share it. We have to start avoiding the worst case thinking that comes with that and start thinking about the worst case of not sharing. What happens if your competitors start building a uh, better reputation because they're more transparent than you are? What happens if the crisis hits and no one trusts you because you've never shared before? You've never, you haven't developed the trust that, uh, that you could have. Important to train employees on what a transparency policy looks like. To talk to your vendors about, and your, your, the companies you partner with so they understand what and why you're looking at transparency. And of course, it does require changes in your IT infrastructure. In some cases, you're going to share with the world, you're going to post information on your website. In other cases, you're going to have a well-defined community of people that you're sharing with, and you need to identify those people. You need to have some kind of control over where your data is going. And then last, you need some kind of mechanism to measure what results you're getting. And this, as I said earlier, is not always easy. So get everyone involved. Higher level, the better. Think about how you can look at pilot projects in different places. And think about what it's going to mean for your IT infrastructure in particular. Because if you build the IT infrastructure well, you can have transparency built in. Obviously, you need to have some way to make sure that the really sensitive information stays protected, stays confidential. It'd be very helpful to have a better identity and authentication system built in so that you don't have the problem of lots of different passwords, lots of different uh, data sets. And it's really important to start looking at how you can have more fine-grained mechanisms for access control and authentication. This means that you might end up with databases where seven columns are public information, two columns are employee only, and two other columns are highly restricted. That requires a lot more work, but the benefit is the ability to share information that could be a huge benefit to your business partners, to your customers, and to your employees. This is a slide that uh, was developed by Adrian Seacom, another one of my colleagues at the Leading Edge Forum, and it's an attempt to show the damage that can occur when information within your company is divulged. So you have on the vertical axis the potential damage that is caused when something is released, and along the horizontal axis, the value of that asset. And as you go from left to right, you are getting to the, 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 the really valuable information in your company. In most companies, there's sort of a default answer to security, and that is it's confidential internal information. We'll spend a lot of money and we'll protect it all. And then there's some really special stuff and we'll protect that even more. The result of doing this is you spend a lot of money unnecessarily because you're protecting a lot of information, which in some cases might as well be public or at least widely shared. And so, at the same time, you may not be protecting everything you need to protect. So you're under-protecting the crown jewels and you're wasting a huge amount of money over-protecting. So by being more transparent, by acknowledging that there's information that really doesn't need to be locked up, by developing multi-tiers of classification and security, you're able to do a better job of protecting the valuable, protecting the not-so-valuable, and sharing the stuff that should and could be shared. And this, is, this takes a different mindset, though. It takes a very different way of thinking, and it requires executives who are willing to take the risk in order to foster transparency. So start a discussion, talk to uh, people who have already done this, learn from the examples that are out there, and start looking for transparency metrics. There's a, a group called World Blue, B-L-U, 
which has published a series of metrics that a company can use to evaluate just how open and transparent it is. You, have, you can go through each of these nine different aspects of transparency and openness and think, okay, what could I do in this area? This is a Chinese menu. No one company is going to do all nine of these things. Most companies, two or three places might be you know, something worth exploring. But identify projects, data sets, where you could be more open, where you could leverage that data for benefit. Think about the downsides as well as the upsides, but start the evaluation now. And think about where you want to be in general. This is a chart that attempts to plot where companies are externally and internally. So the horizontal axis is your internal transparency, where one is completely locked down and 10 is completely open, and the uh, other axis is external. Almost all companies will fall above the dashed line, obviously. It's very hard to be more open externally than it is internally. G is for Google, which is famous for being very open inside, sharing lots of information, as our earlier speaker sh showed us, but not being very good about sharing externally. Defense contractors, intelligence agencies, they tend to be very locked down externally, but they're working hard to share internally so they don't face a 9-11 crisis again. And then in the top corner, we have the Lennox Project and a lot of startups, which tend to be very open just because they want the world to know what they're doing. But you have to decide for yourself. You know, what's your goal? Where, where would you like to be in that chart? Where you be will be determined part by the cost. Uh, this is a, a chart that attempts to show the benefit, the damage, and the cost of being more open. Obviously, the more open you are, the more potential damage there is. Information could leak out, some of your intellectual property could be misused or stolen. At the same time, the benefits of being more open uh, tend to plateau as you get more and more open. The, the, the biggest benefits are often the first things you open up. But the, the interesting curve is the blue curve which shows that it's actually hardest to sort of be in the middle, which is where most companies want to be. Because if you're in the middle, you're protecting some data, you're sharing some data, you have to train your people to know the difference between the data that goes out the door and doesn't. But that's the sweet spot for most companies, is somewhere in the middle zone there, somewhere between about four and, and seven or eight. But the bottom line, you have a security policy, you have privacy policies, you're spending, many companies are spending millions of dollars on both of those things, but most of them don't have a transparency strategy. It's time for most companies to really think hard about what that means, what it could mean if they were more transparent, more open, and where they should make, take advantage of the data they're sitting on in new and creative ways. I worked in the Clinton White House way back when. We had a very simple transparency policy. It was unless there's a really good reason not to put information on the web. I, I was part of the team that got the White House website set up back in, in, two, in, uh, in uh, 1994. Obama went one better. His first executive order was a transparency directive requiring all agencies to take steps to make more information available on the web and the policy was not only to make it available, to, but to make it available in an open format that could be used with the widest possible community. So that's what I have to say about transparency. I'm happy to talk at length or to take questions now, but I think this is an opportunity, if we do it right, to get the highest levels of the organization engaged in a discussion about transparency. CEOs are getting more used to the idea of sharing their own thoughts. Now we have to get them more used to the idea of sharing the company's data. The two go together, and if you can get the high levels of your organization excited about this, they can drive it. In the interviews we've done with a number of different organizations, the thing that was most important in moving companies in the transparent direction and towards more transparency was CEO and board commitment to transparency. A couple pilot projects can make the difference. Show the benefits, show the opportunities, get people excited. So, good luck on all your efforts. I'm very excited what I've heard so far, and I'm happy to take questions if I can see anyone's hand. Thank you, sir. Stay here, man.
we have the house lights up, that's great. Slide over that way a little. Um, I got one question for you before I let them ask. So, uh, DNO liability insurance. So there's so much litigation in the boardroom and there's so much, um, there's so many lawsuits going on that people's default behavior is to do the safe thing because otherwise they're gonna get sued. Right. Uh, it really seems to me like that's what you're fighting here. And until, you know, I once bought a house that I didn't like very much and my expectations were very high and the house was kind of a black hole. And I gradually made the house nicer and I gradually lowered my expectations about the house until one day I reached equilibrium. Right. And it does seem to me like, you know, congressional oversight and the rule of law needs to go down. As Nolan told us this morning, we're in this evolving world where aggregate data, maybe you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the future, whereas you do now. So on the one hand, companies open up, but doesn't the law have to meet them halfway and yeah. sort of give them some protections? Where do you see that going? I, I, well, I live in Washington, and this is the issue that always comes up. Is what, can, am I allowed to do this? Can I be this open? Certainly there are privacy constraints. I think we're going to get past those. The bigger problem is the lawsuits. I, I briefed the, the chairman of uh, the CEO of CSC about this, and his first reaction was, uh, this, is, this is like lawsuit fodder. This is going to make every lawyer very rich because they're going to have all these statements, all these things that they can, they can pull out to make the case. So tomorrow, but I would argue as a privacy troll. Right, but I would argue that actually being more open gives you the context. The quotes are going to come out anyway. You know, if there's a lawsuit, there's a controversy, there's going to be a whistleblower, there's going to be a former employee, there's going to be a current employee who thinks it's the right thing to do to somehow share information. And if, if, if that information gets out by itself and you don't have the full context, I think there's going to be a higher level of lawsuits than if you had been open to start with. A good example is this big fight that Boeing is having with the National Labor Relations Board. They, they have opened up a second airplane production plant in South Carolina. And the charge is that that was done simply to punish the employees in Seattle who had gone on strike several times in the previous five years. If they'd been more transparent about all the different reasons for doing it, it probably would be harder for the case that the government's currently making against them. Right now, they have a couple quotes from a couple executives saying, oh, yeah, we, we can't handle these employees going on strike. Let's move to South Carolina. But if they'd been more honest about all the different reasons for considering a second source, I think that would actually put it in perspective and it would make it much harder for people, the critics, to criticize them. So it's, a, it's a transition. You need the, you need the, it's a the precedence of law to drag you there. Yeah. Well, and I also think we're going to have to have government getting to the point where they demand data rather than demanding compliance. And so if they can say to the company, you know, we won't regulate you and tell you what to do if you tell the world the following 55 things and let the world monitor your behavior. And so that's, that's my hope. But that's kind of a cyber libertarian dream. Uh, I claim I'm a cyber libertarian Democrat. I announced that from the stage once and someone said, and I said, I said, there's, there's not even enough of us for a Facebook group. But somebody started the group on the spot and we now have 60 members of the cyber libertarian Democrat Facebook group. So if you believe that the internet will solve all political problems, sign up today. And so that's your political slogan is blow your own whistle? Yes, all right. blow your own whistle. Um, there was a question from the floor somewhere here. Yes, sir. Well, obviously, it's working. Repeat the, People, question? Uh, the question was whether uh, terms of service could be used to control how data about your company is used to prevent your competitors from getting use of it. Um, it's obviously somewhat successful. Companies are spending a lot of effort to, to try to lock up information. But at the same time, we have all these bloggers. We have employees moving from company to company and you know, taking their knowledge with them. There, there's, there's so many more outlets w than there were five or ten years ago. Uh, the example of Apple is, is one that I often mention. These poor engineers, they, they're, they're like you know, Lady Gaga and Britney Spears. They, they can't go to a bar without three bloggers following them around and you know, trying to steal their prototype cell phones. It's, it's like being, they're like the, the bloggers are like, the, the bloggers in Silicon Valley are like the paparazzi in Hollywood. It's, it's really, there's just this, all these eyes watching you. So over time, as I said, the control is going down. You're just not going to be able to keep everything in-house. 
And so more and more, I think companies will benefit by being more open. And some of the companies that are more open are going to have a, a leg up in the marketplace. They're going to move faster. They're going to recruit better people because they're generating all this buzz and because their employees are high profile and they're making a name for themselves. So you say Apple is like Scarlett Johansson and that they both claim their phone was stolen for self-promotion. <laughs> <laughs> right. Don't quote me on that. Yeah. Great as always, Mike.